Uh, I, before we go on to our final speaker, you have a green sheet in front of, on your place. Um, we're happy to say we're kicking off a new program called the Chamber Smart Education Series, and we're doing this first program in cooperation with Pinellas Technical College. Um, we're doing two Excel courses. Uh, you got a lot of information there on what it's going to cover. Um, if you're like myself, I could do the basic one because I don't, never can get all the lines to add up correctly. Um, I plan on being there, but it's 150 uh, per session. You can take a picture of it right now and sign up if you'd like to. That's pretty cool, huh, Jay? I do have someone that's younger working for me because I do not know how those QR codes work, but she does. So just take a picture of that and hopefully we sell out that program. And we're having it at the computer labs at PTC, right? All right, looking forward to that. Uh, thank you again, Susan, for a great presentation. I know, um, you know, we talked last night, I love watching the politics part of it, but um, like I said, November can't get here soon enough. Now to run out this morning's panel, we have, uh, we welcome for the sixth time, um, to our focus program, Dr. Sean Snape. He's director of the University of Central Florida's Institute for Economic Competitiveness and a nationally recognized economist in the field of business and economic forecasting. He's been quoted in the Wall Street Journal, USA Today, the New York Times, The Economist, CNNMoney.com. He's appeared on CNBC, Fox Business Network, Toronto's Business News Network, and the list goes on. Sean is a member of several national economics forecasting panels, including the Wall Street Journal's Economic Forecasting Survey, the Associated Press's Economy Survey, CNNMoney.com Survey of Leading Economists, and USA Today Survey of Top economics, ec Economists, to name a few. He holds a bachelor's degree in economics from Al Allegheny College and a master and PhD in economics from Pennsylvania State. Sean is a sought-after speaker who has built a national reputation for his ability to explain complex subject matter in a very digestible manner. And we'll hear about that right now. Dr. Sean Snake. Thank you. Thank you. Here again for six times. Go for seven next. All right. I don't know, when was the last time? Two years? Pre-pandemic -pre for sure. Pre-pandemic. Yeah, oh, okay. Well, thank you for having me. Um, wow, what a... What a time uh, it's been. You know, I used to uh, talk about the 2008-2009 recession as the recession of a lifetime, but uh, apparently my life expectancy was longer than uh, I, I was forecasting at the time because 2020 was, uh, in fact, a worse recession than the one we experienced in 2008-2009. It was deeper um, than that recession. We saw higher rates of unemployment. Um, it was historic. It was also historically short. It was the shortest recession in U.S. economic history, lasting only two months. Uh, and it was also, by and large, uh, self-inflicted. Uh, you know, if you roll back the clock to February 2020, uh, the economy was in great shape. Uh, Florida's uh, labor market was uh, the best I'd ever seen. There was three percent unemployment. There was some issues with, with shortages, but it was sort of uh, labor shortages, but it was sort of limited to you know, uh, skilled tradespeople in construction. You didn't see these you know, widespread labor shortages, uh, pan industry that we're seeing today. And you know, I, I stopped at a, a racetrack one time on my way uh, home from, from a speaking event. I needed to get gas, but more than that, I needed to use the bathroom. And so I put the nozzle in the car and I, I walked uh, towards the, the, the convenience store and I pulled on the door, it was locked. And I, I kind of panicked. I, I, I don't want to say my fight or flight instinct kicked in. It was more, at my age, it's more flight. Because I started thinking, I'm like, yeah, is this place being robbed, you know? And I'm looking to see if somebody's tied up behind the Slurpee machine or, <laughs> yeah, it's kind of panicky. And then I saw the sign, you know, temporarily closed due to labor shortage. And I'm like, wow, you know, I mean, they, they don't make their money selling the gas at those, those businesses. They make their money selling you, uh, you know, hot fries and, and soda. So to see that shut down, you know, sort of hit it home. But, you know, how did we get here? I think, uh, you know, not only did the COVID policies, and, and pre-COVID, by the way, uh, public health policy never really entertained, let's shut down the economy. You know, that was never viewed, and I was just shocked when this happened uh, in 2020. I mean, I couldn't, I couldn't really believe my eyes, and I started thinking about, this is like medieval times, right, with the, when the Black Plague uh, hit Europe, right? Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the stories there, but, 
you know, the belief then, they didn't know about viruses and bacteria and all that. The belief was that this is punishment from God. Uh, and so what some people did then was to sort of show God how sorry they were uh, for their sins. They would, you know, flog themselves, you know, just beat themselves on their back until it was bloody, right? And look, God, I'm really sorry. And then they died of uh, the plague. Uh, it's all like, we're, we're, you know, history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. So we kind of flogged ourselves economically and shut down large swaths of the economy in, in some attempt, and I'm not sure exactly how this was going to work to stop the virus. Uh, I would suggest, and you know, maybe when truth makes a return uh, again, that uh, and, and uh, we have a little distance from this episode. This is, you know, maybe the biggest public policy mistake in this country's history, um, and shared by a lot of the world. Quite frankly, uh, the, the damage that was done, we're still feeling. You know, all the major issues on the economic front, I say, have their roots in COVID-19 policy. Uh, the supply chain issues that we heard the professor discuss earlier, high rates of inflation, high oil and gas prices, and these labor market shortages, all are tied to what we did in our attempt uh, to handle COVID-19. So how does this lead to that? Well, we shut down the economy, right? Well, just, you know, non-essential businesses. How about that? I mean, you know... Uh, how many people think their business is non-essential? I, 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 you know, I don't know who decided what was what, but I do know this, my hair grew down to my shoulders over the course of the pandemic. Um, and it started because my barber was shut down for five months. Now during that five months time, my golden doodle was able to get his hair cut. Uh, because the dog rumor was, I guess, more essential than, than my barber. Again, makes no sense. I mean, maybe the one-way aisles in Publix, you know, maybe that was really the thing that saved us. Uh, you know, because you could just feel the viruses hitting you in the back of the head as you were, you know, trying to find toilet paper. Uh, so a, a lot of crazy things, but shutting down the economy, of course, I think starts this whole supply chain crisis, right? So the professor explained, you know, it's end to end. It starts with manufacturing, and then you've got to drive that road to get to the bread. Um, we shut down manufacturing, okay, now we're behind the, the eight ball there. And so the economy was shut down for two months by and large, and then it opened back up. And the economy sprung back to life, because this was not, again, a normal recession. This didn't gradually happen as the economy slowed and reached that peak, it was lights out, recession. February 2020, things were great. March and April, we're in this historic recession open things up again, boom, things start rocketing back. And so all that pent up spending, right, and I've called it pent up demand squared. Any, any recession, there's pent up demand. And what that means is that, you know, for most in this room, I would assume, during the recession, you were still able to work. You know, you could just sit on a computer and do your thing. Um, but even though you were working and your income might not have been impacted, you probably did not spend the same way you would under n different circumstances. And so that spending that doesn't happen, that could have been financed by the income uh, of consumers, but it's held back, so we're not going to take the vacation, there's a recession, I'm not going to get the new car, we're not going to you know, redo the bathroom, I'm just going to wait. That's pent up demand. And then when the economy leaves recession, things stabilize, that pent up demand gets vented. And that typically fuels the early phase of, of an economic recovery. So the deeper the recession, the more pent up demand. And so we have this explosion of pent up demand, but I call it pent up demand squared because not only do we have this traditional notion of pent up demand, we were pent up literally with people formerly known as our loved ones. And when the economy opened up again, <laughs> I never noticed how loud my teenage daughters blink um, until COVID-19. I mean, it is a deafening sound. Um, but people wanted to go out and do things, and, and you know the things they hadn't been able to do for several months. And so we get this double, you know, boosted pent-up demand, and the economy takes off. Now that runs into this supply chain issue. And, and you know now we got to ramp up manufacturing again, and now we're seeing, as uh, the professor said, with the whole logistics side of the supply chain now, uh, all that demand came just pouring out of the recession and really overwhelmed you know a, a just-in-time oriented supply chain. 
Then the government continued because it had shut things down in this uh, failed attempt to stop COVID-19, had to make up for that. And so we saw the CARES Act and, and trillions of dollars of subsequent spending that they're still talking about. Uh, you know, hasn't happened yet, but there's still talk about another two or three trillion dollars of spending uh, in Washington, D.C. So you've got this pent up demand exploding. Now you've got the government heaping gasoline onto the economy, fueling uh, that pent up demand. So, this is an ongoing assault to this supply chain. And I think, uh, yes, by the mid part of the year, that excess demand will start to normalize here, but I still think there's more, you know, more time to, to catch up uh, from all that. I don't think the, uh, the lots at, at auto dealers are gonna be filled up uh, you know, in a few months' time. This is, this is gonna take some time. So we got these supply chain issues, again, tied in COVID. What about high uh, oil and gasoline prices? It's all Biden's fault, right? So, Susan, are you putting those stickers on the gasoline pumps where Joe Biden is pointing at the cost of a gallon and says, I did this? I don't know who's doing that. Is that an effective campaign strategy? I just, I, I've never seen anything like that. But uh, some people wanted to blame uh, the Biden administration for what they did about leases on, uh, on drilling on, on uh, oil uh, on, on federal lands. And that played a role. But really, these high gas prices go back to COVID-19 policies. Right? We shut everything down, schools are closed, you can't go to work, you're working remotely, can't travel. So all of a sudden the demand for oil and gasoline collapses. And you may or may not recall in 2020 the price of oil actually went negative at one point. Because you just got all this oil out there and it costs money to keep it on a ship and, and it's that, so the price actually went below zero. That was the profit maximizing thing to do, you know, give it away, essentially. Pay someone to take it. You lose less money. Well, how much investment in new oil rigs uh, is going to happen when the price of oil is negative? Zero. So you just saw a plunge in, in rig counts. And then, boom, demand comes soaring back again. Now we're at these low rig counts, and up goes the price tied to it. Labor market shortages. You know. February 2020, as I said, just roll everything back and look at the economy then to where we are now. Some shortages here or there, but not this widespread. Business is not having to close because they don't have workers. Uh, why did that happen? Well, I would argue, and you know, anecdotally and speaking to my students, there's some truth to this. The people that aren't going back to work, they're not the uh, you know, orthopedic surgeons, right? You, know, you, you don't hear people uh, in the hospital say, I don't know, they just never came back after COVID. <laughs> <laughs> Can't get my knee done. Now, there's no orthopedic surgery. These are largely lesser skilled uh, workers, quite frankly. And so I talk to my students. I'm like, were well, you working pre-pandemic? Yeah. Are you working now? No. Why not? I don't need to. Because what happened during the pandemic? Well, the restaurants all closed. The bars all closed. You got unemployment insurance. Not a huge amount in Florida, but hey, you get a $300 boost from the federal government. Oh, by the way, you get a $1,400 check, and you get a $1,400 check. It's, you know, everybody gets one. It's like Oprah's Christmas shows. You ever watch those, right? Everybody gets a check. Not just one, but two, and sometimes uh, more. I have a daughter. She's never filed taxes in her life, works at a preschool. I got a $1,000 check. I'm like, what'd you get that for? She says, well, I'm a teacher. I'm like, oh, dear God. <laughs> of course, that money was spent. You can believe that. You know, affected the supply chain at Sephora. But um, <laughs> you know, these people didn't have to. And if I'm a student, I've got a few roommates. I mean, am I going to rush back to scrubbing pots at Buffalo Wild Wings when you know I can pay my rent, I can play some Xbox, I can get my medicinal marijuana, and you know, take my classes? Why am I going to pay high gas prices and go back to work? So again, the labor shortages I think are implicated. Now that's not all that happened. There's People's labor market participation is a very complex thing, but, um, and inflation. You know, when there's shortages, what happens in markets? Well, prices rise. And so this is persistent. I don't think inflation is going to go away very quickly. I think the Fed's going to have to move rapidly this year, probably raising rates five times, uh, because you don't want the roots of inflation to, to get too deep in the economy. And it's already impacting psychology. And when people start expecting inflation, shows up in cost of living adjustments, and you get these sort of wage price 
spirals that you know those of us who were alive in the 1970s remember played such a prominent role in the persistent high inflation at the time. I'm going to move uh, quickly here. I know we're already over time. Uh, I, I think the recovery uh, continues. I think it's strong the first half of 2022. Uh, I think the second half things normalize in terms of that pent-up demand squared. I think there's policy uncertainty here. I think the Fed's going to move. We're already starting to see markets get a little more uh, volatile financial markets. So I think the first half of this year is going to be just fine. The second half, I think risks start to rise. And we're rolling into an election year as well. Um, Florida, the, the housing market, uh, unlike the last recession, housing, of course, was sort of ground zero uh, of what happened here in Florida. And it weighed on Florida's recovery for many years. Uh, that's not the case now. We have a problem in the housing market, but it's the same problem we had pre-pandemic. There's not enough. And it was exacerbated, as we saw, by what, it, uh, what happened in the supply chain and what happened to prices of building materials. This is data from Florida Realtors. This is uh, median prices of single-family homes. Uh, the red is a 12-month moving average. Blue is the monthly data. And you can see prices are well above where they were at the peak uh, of the housing bubble in 2006. Why? You know, are we doing this again? Uh, you know, is Florida man up to it uh, one more time? Inflating another housing bubble, right? The state needs a better PR uh, firm, I think. You know, we, all, we get kicked around a lot uh, in the media. But uh, I would say no, this is not a housing bubble um, that was uh, what we witnessed in 05 and 06. Uh, and here's why. If you look uh, statewide, you can see prices are up you know, almost 20% year over year. You know, this is for an existing single family home. This is not Bitcoin. Uh, you're not supposed to see prices rise 20%. Uh, like that. Why is that happening? Well, look at the bottom row. This is the inventory. It's measured in how long the existing number of homes for sale would last in terms of months given current levels of demand, and it's down to 1.2 months. Down from two months a year ago. A real estate economist would tell you that six to nine months of inventory is, about, is a balanced market. Here, your, your local realtor would say, oh, this is a seller's market. Your local uh, economics professor would say, there's a, there's a shortage in housing. And so this has effects on inflation. It's driving rents higher. Um, and it's not something, that, unfortunately, that's going to be quickly resolved. Uh, if you look around the state, and Tampa here is a good example, prices are, uh, rise even faster in areas where inventory is even lower, less than one month of inventory. Uh, in the Tampa metropolitan area. I mean, this is minuscule. Uh, this is nothing, and you know, consequently, over 23% year-over-year price appreciation. Uh, statewide, you know, I think we bounced back um, pretty well. Tourism uh, was just devastated by COVID-19 and by the lockdowns. Uh, it's still not fully recovered. Uh, but we are seeing domestic leisure travel, I would say, is back to pre-pandemic levels. It's the business travel and the um, international travel uh, that is still lagging uh, that I think will take the rest of 2022 to, to, to sort of recover. But uh, a big hit because of uh, COVID, uh, a pretty sharp uh, bounce back. I think we continue to outperform the national economy, both in terms of uh, economic and job growth. And you can kind of see what happened here. Um, here's the peak unemployment rate in Florida uh, from the 2008-2009 recession. And here's that peak in 2020, uh, significantly higher and occurring in just a fraction of the time. The labor market <laughs> typically lags the overall economy by you know, uh, one and a half to two years. Here, this was instantaneous. There was no lags. Your business is non-essential, shut it down. Well, if I'm shut down, I don't need employees. Everybody's fired. And up goes uh, the unemployment rate, overwhelming the uh, unemployment insurance system, because this is just not how the labor market behaves. You can see here, it took several years for unemployment to reach its peak last cycle. This was something uh, you know, that was just historically an anomaly. Uh, you can see state GDP uh, plummeted again. You know, tourism really ground to a halt. Uh, in 2020. Other businesses thrived uh, during 2020 and during the recession. This is another unusual feature to see some businesses going on massive hiring sprees while other businesses were laying off all their employees. But one thing I do want to point out quickly, and I'll, I'll, I'll end here, I know we're running late, 
Uh, if you ignore COVID-19 and, and what we did to ourselves, uh, a la Ed Norton and the Fight Club, um, the trends here really aren't changed. The things that drive Florida's economy are not impacted by COVID-19. COVID-19 pandemics are transitory events. And you typically don't see permanent impacts from transitory events, despite what everybody says, right? You've heard people saying office space is dead. Nobody's going to work in an office anymore. Oh, really? You know, we had the same technology before COVID-19. Why, why weren't we zooming it up back then? So it's not the same thing. It's a substitute. It's not a perfect substitute. If it was a perfect substitute, then offices would have died a long time ago, and so would have you know, college campuses. We can just do all this remotely. Why do we need all these expensive buildings? It's not the same. Right? You're on the screen with your Brady Bunch friends. Uh, the meeting ends, and it shuts down. Today, this meeting will end. We'll walk out there on the way to the restroom to the car. People are going to chat, mention something. Hey, did you hear about something? Stuff happens beyond. Uh, when you have that interpersonal stuff. So, uh, I, I, you know, things are not permanently changed. Population growth, uh, economic growth, I think, really isn't going to be impacted here in Florida. Uh, you can see leisure and hospitality, pretty devastated. But again, this is a temporary thing. You know, we'll see those visitors surging above $100 million, uh, 100 million uh, per year. Uh, and, and, and that will happen. Statewide, just quickly, uh, job growth is starting to slow because we're, we're getting close to full employment again. Uh, it didn't take long because we were near full employment before the whole COVID lockdown. And again, this was no traditional uh, recession. Here in Tampa, of course, uh, you know, the whole I-4 corridor, uh, not only politically uh, is it important, it's very important economically. It is, uh, it is the breadbasket of the state. Uh, Miami, the three county metro area, is about the same size as an economy as Orlando and Tampa combined right now. But the growth prospects are much different for South Florida. And it really comes down to geography. Right? You've got the Everglades, you've got the Atlantic. So traditionally, where does Miami grow? It grows up I-95. Well, there's limits to that, or it can grow vertically. Here between Tampa and Daytona Beach, there's room to grow everywhere. And I think that will continue to be the case. Uh, here, again, Legion Hospitality, some of this is still bounced back. But you see uh, growth in information. Uh, this is really driven by 5G software. You know, before that used to be kind of a, 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 you know, a, a, a bit of a desperate sector because you were seeing traditional publishing, which is part of that sector, you know, go the way of the, the, the buffalo. Uh, but that's kind of uh, eased or, or equilibrated. And now we're seeing job growth more on the data and tech side uh, of that particular sector. So I'm about 10 minutes over. Uh, all of our forecasts are on the Institute for Economic Forecasting website. Feel free to uh, peruse those at your leisure. And uh, thank you very much for having me down again.